So our first speaker is Stephanie Farone from the Physics Department, and she'll be telling us about quantum interference effects with multimode fibers. So my name is Stephanie Farone. I work in the Physics Department. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Todd Pittman, and I'm going to be speaking about quantum interference effects with multimode fibers. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the background of the science behind the research that I did. Then we'll look at the experimental setup, take a look at the data that we've collected thus far, and then look at what we're going to be doing next. So first we'll start with background. Our specific research goal is to determine the efficacy of multi-mode beam splitters compared with that of single-mode beam splitters. So before I go any further, I'll stop, step back, and I won't lose you here, and I'll talk about why we actually care about this. We're looking specifically at entangled photons. And entangled photons have a lot of practical applications. They can be used in quantum teleportation, which involves sending information across non-connected locations. And they can also be used in quantum computing, which has specific applications in accelerating the speed and the capabilities of computers. So the basic science behind this is something called a beam splitter. And this, at its most basic level, can be looked at as a free space beam splitter. So we've got this purple beam splitter across here, and we send one beam of light in this way and another beam of light in that way. And then what happens next? A variety of things can happen. First, each beam can be transmitted through the beam splitter, or alternately, each beam can be reflected, or one beam can be reflected, one transmitted, or vice versa. Each of these different states are possible. And you'll notice that each state, in each state, I can tell which, which way the blue one has gone, which way the red one has gone. That is, which beam was transmitted and which beam was reflected. If, however, I can't tell the two apart when one transmits and one reflects, these become what is known as indistinguishable. So we, call, we say that in this beam splitter, when we can't tell the two apart, the, the beams become indistinguishable. We can also build this beam splitter, not in free space, but using optical fibers. And there are two types of optical fibers that exist. The first is a single mode fiber. And you can see that only one mode of light transmit, translates down this optical fiber. The other type is a multi-mode fiber, and you can see a variety of modes, up to thousands of modes of light, can transmit down each of these fibers. So the beam splitter that was previously displayed can be constructed sending those blue and red beams of light in via a single mode fiber or via a multi-mode fiber. So when we applied this in lab, we had a somewhat complex experimental setup. So we started over here with an ultraviolet laser, and that went through something called a BBO crystal. And this produced pairs of the entangled photons about which I spoke earlier. And this entire setup in the orange box is something that's known as parametric down conversion. And that is what is used to produce pairs of entangled photons. And you can see next a photograph of this in our setup in the lab. So here we have the ultraviolet laser. It comes through, and it goes through the BBO crystal. And so we then have pairs of entangled photons that are shooting out here. And it's important to notice right here, we've got things that are called optical wedges. And these can be moved, and they can therefore, when they're moved, they can alter the length of the path that the photon travels. So if we, make, so if we move them a certain way, it will make this path length longer, and we can make this path length shorter. So the entangled photons come out here, and each of them goes into a coupler, and you can see trailing out here, it goes into a single or a multi-mode fiber that leads to the single or multi-mode fiber beam splitter. And here in this slide, you can see in orange, we have this beam splitter. So the entangled photon pairs come out here, these boxes represent the couplers, and the photons then travel through a beam splitter, and then are sent out into detectors that can detect when a photon hits them. And these detectors go into a computer, and we can tell when a photon is sent through via a program called LabVIEW. And 
It's important to note that this setup is what's parallel to what was previously discussed with the free space beam splitter. So in essence, we have that blue beam of light going in here, the red beam of light going through here. And when they're indistingu indistinguishable, when I can't tell if this is the blue or the red beam, and if this one is the blue or the red beam, they cancel out. There are no longer photons hitting both detectors. They only go into one detector, and therefore the indistinguishable amplitudes of the photons are canceling. So we only get, co we only get counts in one detector. We no longer get coincidence counts or counts that occur simultaneously in each detector. And we've taken data of this in lab. We started by looking at a single mode beam splitter. So you can see out on either end, at these points, the photons are distinguishable. You, can't, you can tell them apart. You can tell which beam is the blue beam, which beam is the red beam. And you can see we're getting about 180 coincidence counts per half second. So we're getting almost 400 counts a second of non-canceling non photons. But when we alter the path length ever so slightly, these indistinguishable amplitudes completely cancel out. And we go from about 180 counts, 180 coincidence counts per half second, to about six. So that's about 95 or 98% decrease in the amount of coincidence counts we're getting. So you can see that at this point, the two beams are clearly indistinguishable. So we no longer have coincidence counts. We only have one of those detectors going off at once. So this was done using the single mode beam splitter. And the phenomenon we observed, we were not the first to observe it. Uh, it's known as the Hongo mandel dip, um, referring to this shape. What we tried to do next is we looked at a, a multi-mode beam splitter. We took that single mode beam splitter out, we, and then we inserted a multi-mode beam splitter. And you can see the data is nothing like what we previously obtained. So these data are completely different. So at this point, we have to step back and wonder why. What's going on here? And there are a couple of things that we thought of. It could be, you can see how this on the right hand side of the graph, it is rising. So could we just be really zoomed in on that Hongo mandel dip? Or does this effect simply not occur with multi-mode beam splitters? At this point, we are not sure. We are developing uh, methods in, by which to test this. If we're really zoomed in, then maybe we could simply insert more optical wedges and then we'd be able to take a zoomed out picture and maybe we would be able to see that dip. Or an alternate theory is that if that dip simply doesn't exist, it's because of some property inherent to multi-mode fibers. And therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to examine the multi-mode fibers themselves and see if it's simply not capable of creating that interference effect, that indistinguishable amplitudes. So what next? So first, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to look at a larger range of path length differences. We're going to try to make that path even bigger, try to zoom out that picture with the multi-mode beam splitter. And at that point, we're going to compare the data we're getting with the single mode beam splitter, that, that very nice dip that you saw. And we'll look at the multi-mode data that we've obtained and see if there are any ways that we can change our setup, any things that we can make better, or, or any things that we think that we can do to obtain that dip. And if we find that we can obtain that Hongo Mandel dip with a multi-mode beam splitter, that will mean that a multi-mode beam splitter can be used in place of a single mode beam splitter in an experimental setup. And if you remember the picture from earlier, in that single mode fiber, you only had one mode propagating down the fiber, which means that you need to be a lot more precise using a single mode fiber in an experimental setup that fiber is disrupted a lot more easily. So they're very difficult. Single mode fibers are very difficult to use in an experimental setup. So if we find that a multi-mode fiber produces the same effect, if we find that they're comparable, then multi-mode fibers, which require a lot less precision to use, which are disrupted a lot less easily, 
those can be used in the place of single mode fibers, not just in a research setting, but also, say, in an undergraduate laboratory setting. Uh, and that will simplify a lot of experimentation that we can then do on fields such as quantum teleportation and quantum computing. So I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Todd Pittman, my mentor, uh, Junlin Net Liang, who is a graduate student who's worked closely with me in the lab. And this work was also funded in part under the National Science Foundation grant listed on the slide. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. So we have time for a couple questions, if there are any. <laughs> What's your guess? Do you think it'll it'll work or, or, or won't work with your multi-mode beam flares? I think at this point the exhaustiveness with which we've searched our experimental setup so far would seem to indicate that it's not going to work, at least you know, with the fibers and the setup that we currently have. So that grant money could have gone into the event. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, does, does the National Science Foundation <laughs> agree with that? Science used to mean knowledge. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right, well, thank you all very much.